one other uh, general note uh, in your in your lecture guide, I forgot there that that political support. If we're going to talk about the politics of the day and the reform movement, Whigs were generally more supportive of all these different reforms that we just talked about than the Democrats were. Just as a general rule, that was part of their pl party platform that they were supportive of, of most of these things as they went. All right. Okay, so letter A, education. Public education, that is uh, to say tax-supported education where people put tax dollars uh, into the coffers to go to pay for teachers and the building of schools and all that said. Why? Well, again, mixing the politics of the day, if we're going to give every white man the right to vote, whether they've got an education or whether they've got land or not, well, uh, rather than let, how should I put this, ignorant people vote, because they haven't had an education, the better concept was let's educate them as a means of protecting uh, democracy and the republic that we've already formed. So in terms of why, we want an educated voting base, right? especially in light of white male suffrage that was going on at the time. So where were these reforms more successful? They uh, were less successful in the South. Remember, South was based on plantation life. Cities are uh, few and far between. Right? Most of the education that took place on the plantation was private tutoring that uh, the plantation owner would call a private tutor there to live with their family and to tutor their children and educate them. Uh, slaves were not allowed to. In many, many southern states, it was against the law to teach your slave to read and write. So um, African Americans are not enjoyed. Even in northern states, uh, a lot of times African Americans were excluded uh, from the right to be educated. Not all the time, but, but a lot of time that was. So it was less successful in the South, where we see it take on, and, and it's no surprise when we look back to the Puritan history, uh, the Northeast is where education is going to be big, particularly in the state of Massachusetts, uh, because the, you know, no doubt because of the Puritan in influence that they had, as well as that. Now, public education was not what we would call it today. You know, we, you and I, you, know, you go to school 180 days out of the year, you get 10 weeks off for vacation. Uh, in those days, public education would have been just a couple months a year, and certainly not all day because kids had work to do uh, on the farm or at home helping out, even in you know, small factory towns and whatnot. So uh, not what you and I would think of education. Very little money was spent. Uh, the teachers were not very good. Most teachers were men. They were underpaid. Uh, and there very little training in terms of getting teachers prepared for how students learn best and all that stuff. So not even close to what you and I would uh, consider public education of today. Right? Now the innovators and the pioneers of public education, Horace Mann, I would put three stars by his name. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, he was on your list of people to make flashcards for. Right? Horace Mann uh, hailed, he was on the board of, State Board of Education in Massachusetts, right? and uh, was very influence, uh, influential in the rise of public, uh, public education. He fought for more public schools, uh, for longer school terms to keep kids in schools longer, uh, higher pay for teachers, an expanded curriculum, and then uh, for more teacher training as far as that goes. So Horace Education, big in Massachusetts and, and big in getting the ball rolling. Massachusetts being kind of the, uh, the model for other states and then it would spread throughout New England. Um, Noah Webster, next on your list. And Noah Webster, not Daniel Webster, but Noah Webster was the guy that wrote the dictionary and he wrote several other reading books that were uh, very prominent in that day and age. If you're gonna have a school chances are that your readers, that your kids were learning to read from, and your writing books and those things might have been developed by Noah Webster. Uh, also, like Noah Webster, William McGuffey. You guys are way too young to remember, but even I remember growing up in the 60s, and uh, my first readers were McGuffey readers. All right? And William McGuffey is a guy that lived during this, this time and age, and uh, he was a teacher, both a teacher and a preacher, Second Great Awakening, right? So all of the books that he wrote not only included uh, lessons on how to read and res lessons how to write, but they also included moral lessons and patriotism was part of that 
all involved in, in any McGuffey reader that they had. All right. Now, just a few general observations on education in this era. It would be far-reaching to say that education, public education, exploded. By the Civil War, in all of the United States, there were maybe a hundred public schools in the entire nation, a hundred. So, and, and, you know, most of those just being primary schools up to what we would call the eighth grade today. Even fewer secondary schools, high schools, as far as that goes. So we can't say that public education took off and was a great boom in terms of that. Uh, but we can say, and we, we're going to say this a lot about the 1800s, that the ball got rolling and it was a good start. It was a good start to public education with guys like Horace Mann uh, leading the way uh, on how to do those things. All right, But uh, to, to overstate that it was a great success, mm, that would be definitely overstating it. Now, upper education or higher institutions such as colleges, uh, the Great Awakening, just like the Second Great Awakening, just like the first one, uh, lots of new Christians, lots of new churches, and we need to train ministers. So a lot of those religions will start seminaries for students to learn how to be pastors and missionaries. All right, so we're going to see some of those. Some of them will be liberal arts colleges where, where you get a general education and other those more religiously minded as far as that goes. Um, I want to say a bunch of the Ivy League schools like Dartmouth and uh, oh, a couple other ones were, were developed during this time period. Um, uh, state, some public colleges, state colleges were started. To, actually, this uh, North Carolina established its first uh, state university back in 1795. Of course, my question is, who was the president in 1795? Figure that one out. And then Thomas Jefferson, of course, started the University of Virginia. That'll be after he retires from the presidency that he gets that going. Somewhere in the era of good feelings in the uh, 1815s, 1820s, in that, that time period. Women's colleges. We are going to get our first women's colleges to educate women. And you have a list there. Uh, Troy Female Seminary, and any seminary is a religious college to train women, uh, was started by a lady uh, by the name of Emma Willard. Emma Willard, and she established that in 1821. So that's fairly early on. Again, who was the president in 1821? The next college you have on your list is Oberlin College, and Oberlin College is actually the first co-ed college where both men and women attend uh, classes together. That was established in 1837, and again, it was the president in 1837. Right. And the last one you have on your list there is a, another female seminary, Mount Holyoke Seminary, which was started by a lady by the name of Mary Lyon, L-Y-O-N, Mary Lyon, also in 1837, the same year as Oberlin College. So good news for women in that we have some colleges and universities that women can now attend and get an education together. I believe the next thing you have on your list is lyceums. Right? And put three stars by that. You want to remember that. Lyceums um, are kind of like homeschooling for adults, if you will, or, or night school for adults. Um, adults, of course, work during the day. And lyceums uh, were traveling speakers. And Ralph Waldo Emerson, the famous transcendentalist, is a great example of he hit the Lyceum Trail where he would go from town to town to town delivering speeches and, ta and talking on different things. And the speakers were varied and the topics were varied. Uh, some, of, some of it philosophical, some of it political, some of it science. Hey, you, you guys have chapter 15 and all the different, uh, uh, oh gosh, reforms that were coming up. It's not just the reforms, but different... Uh, uh, Trying to think of the word. Just different things that were happening, and experts in those areas would come around and, and speak onto that. So lyce lyceums were traveling schools where people would come to your town, and you could go listen to them after work and whatnot. And then we even get a few magazines as America became more literate. Right? And I believe that one million adults was the statistic I saw uh, of people that could read that were literate at this time. Um, could read, and so magazines will pop up, and one in particular is uh, Gotti's Ladies 
book was a magazine that appealed obviously to ladies as far as that goes. So uh, education uh, beginning to, to, to take root. But again, you know, don't, don't overstate the case. It, it just gets the grounds going in terms of things like that.